Amen. I want to affirm Clean Man. Thank you for those songs this morning. Um, yeah, I, I this morning I'm, I'm doing a message that is in preparation for Friends Sunday, and I was all geared up, ready to preach out of Luke chapter 10, you know, which I've pr- preached on here a little bit before, but I didn't really uh, hone into it like I normally have done in the past, and and I just could not get out of Luke 9. Uh, it was like the Lord had arrested me in Luke chapter 9. So we're going to do a little bit different of a preaching this morning. Your notes are in your Bible in Luke chapter 9. So you can go there and uh, you can get ready. But, you know, the themes that the Lord was pulling out to me out of Luke 9 were a lot of the themes that we were singing about this morning in worship. And, um, you know, that we didn't plan that. We didn't try that, you know. And so... Even though you know we we knew where we were, were were heading in preparation for Friends Sunday, so I just clean. I just really want to affirm you in that uh, you're really led by the Lord in that. Uh, so that's awesome. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So um, here at Newport, one of the things that we really love and that we really want to see happen in, and that we really believe, we believe that every person is called by God and has received gifts. And so we want to see every person released in the gifting that God has given to you. Amen? We, you know, so you don't all have to be like me. Yeah, and I don't have to be like, you know, like Sheree or, or like Alan. Like we all get to be us. We all get to be who God has created us to be, but we want to we wanna help everyone find those giftings. And so, uh, you know, there's two things when we talk about being released into ministry, you know, we believe that every, every person is a minister, every person is, is both a priest and a minister to the Lord and to others. And one of the things that we, that we look for is we look for two things. We look for gifting. What has God called you to be? Uh, who has he called you to be? And how has he called you to function specifically in the body? And then we look for character. Character is how do you respond to correction? How do you respond to confrontation? And how do you respond to accountability? Yeah? And so uh, because we want everybody healthy. We want everybody healed up, healthy, and running full steam ahead because that's what it's going to take to see the lost come into the body of Christ in our generation. It's going to take, uh, you know, those of us who are just passionate, and that's every one of us who are passionate, healed up, whole, and running hard after God and functioning in the giftings of who God has specifically created you to be. Yeah? So I just want to encourage you in that, you know, you know, those, that gifting, if you're not sure, like, what your gifting is, I can tell you you have one. You might be sitting there saying, I don't know what my gifting is. I don't know what God's called me to. You have a gift, yeah. all right? You have a gift. It might look different than somebody else's gift. Uh, it might be a gift that maybe the church historically hasn't valued or something. But we want, we want a ministry to be gift-based in, in Newport. We don't want it to, you know, we don't want uh, ministry roles to be assigned by, like, you know, seniority, like, well, you've been here for 20 years, and you've been here for, like, 15, so you have to wait, you know, <laughs> like, we want, you know, we want giftings to be, uh, we want ministry, uh, specifically in Newport Church and teams and all that, to be gift-based, like, who is God calling you to be? Um, there's a really good book that talks about getting the right people in the right seats on the bus, you know, and that, that we just run together as a well-oiled machine, and that's what God has called us to be, that's who God has called us to be, Amen. So, so I bet that every person's gifting is somehow complementary to everyone else's gifting. Yeah? Amen? And so let's just, let's find that. Let's engage that. Let's find that. And then, you know, so we want to, you know, we want people to encounter their giftings that the Lord has given them. We also want people to be teachable in their character. And so you don't have to know everything. Please, you know, we'd rather that you don't. <laughs> you know, if you think... <laughs> You know, it, uh, you don't have to know everything. We just need to be teachable, right? Because we can walk through it together. Amen. I walk through life together. So, are you there in Luke chapter nine? I gave you enough time to to get there. Um, this morning, I had one of those mornings that men, you know, maybe you've had, uh, most likely, where you know I got up and I was ready, and I was like, I thought I was looking good, you know. And my wife says to me, "You're not going to stand up and preach." looking like that, are you? <laughs> so we had a, uh, a good 15-minute uh, wardrobe change. 
like, no, 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 but I like, no, it doesn't, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're comfortable, I don't know. <laughs> no, anyway, all right. <laughs> and it's all about, you know, uh, preparation. And, and in Luke chapter 9, we see that uh, Jesus is preparing to send out, if you, know anything, uh, if you read forward in Luke chapter 10, he sends out 70 disciples. Now, this just wasn't like the 12. This was 70. This was a, a, probably a large portion of those who were following him in that time. And in Luke chapter 9, he actually takes time to prepare them. And he prepares them to send them out. And so as we're heading up to, to Friends Sunday, my heart is that the preparation that Jesus gave to the disciples in Luke chapter 9 would also be the preparation of our heart. Because Jesus wants you to look good. <laughs> All right? Jesus wants you to look good. All right, so let's read. Uh, let's, do, let's do this. Chapter 9, verses 1, it says, And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, no staff, take, uh, yes, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. Wow. Okay. That might be a little bit different than the way we go out about ministry. But tell your neighbor, say, Hey, Jesus is enough. So you might not feel like you're qualified to talk to your neighbor. You know, that horrible example we saw up here of reaching out you know, and talking to our neighbors on the video. You know, the guy speaking Spanish because he made an assumption. You might not feel qualified. You might not feel uh, uh, like uh, empowered to do that. But I want to encourage you this morning that Jesus is enough. If you have the presence of Jesus with you, that's all you need. Amen? All these other things, they're good, but... Jesus is enough, okay? So he told them not to take money bag, uh, staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics, verse 4. And whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart, wherever they do not receive you. And when you leave the town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And then it says this. It's very interesting. In verse 6 it says, And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Wow. Man, that's cool. You know, they, they went out and they did it. They went and they preached the gospel and they were healing everywhere. They started to get some experience in this Christian walk thing, in this ministry to others thing. They started to get some experience. They started to, to see some successes, you know, of, of people receiving their message of, and, and, and people also getting impacted and empowered by the presence of Jesus in their life. They started to, to have these, these experiences. And then, you know, Luke here, because he kind of, you know, Matthew and other, other accounts of this, they go into a little bit more depth of detail. But Luke, the writer of, of, of Luke here, he, he really wants to hone down on something. And so there are certain things that's interesting to me he just kind of glosses through. And then other things he really highlights. And so here in Luke 7 down to 9, he highlights something. And I'm like, okay, this is a little weird. But it says, now Herod the Tetrarch heard all that was happening. And he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead. And by some that Elijah had appeared. And by others that one of the prophets of old had risen. And, and Herod, verse 9, Herod said, John, I beheaded. But who is this whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. There, you know, Luke here, he, he wants us, you know, in the light, in the backdrop of, of everyone, you know, going and seeing miracles and preaching the gospel and, and seeing uh, measures of success. Luke wants to make sure that we don't forget that John the Baptist was beheaded. Oh, that's sobering, <laughs> you know. And so, uh, let's read on here, because we want the Word of God to speak to us this morning, okay? So they went in, uh, you know, they, they, the disciples are going out, they're preaching the gospel, they're healing everywhere, it says, they're seeing some success. I don't know about what their mentality was, but, you know, like, if we, if we understand that the disciples are actually younger in age uh, than than historically has been a thought. You know, they were probably teenagers or late in their late teens when they were doing this. So if you can imagine, like, teenagers that are going out and they're like, yeah, this is working. Like, this ministry thing, 
yeah, it's going, you know. And in light of that, you know, uh, we, we, we see, you know, Luke brings into that scenario, you know, and, and I don't know, maybe they were getting con- you know, maybe a little overconfident or maybe they started to see how this ministry thing could be really cool and work out well for them. And they were obviously getting noticed. They were getting known. Herod the Tetrarch uh, heard about them, heard about what Jesus was doing, heard about what was happening. And this is the same guy who persecuted John the Baptist, took his head. And, uh, you know, they were starting to get some notoriety. And in Luke, it uh, as we go down to verse 9, it, it says that um, John was beheaded, and it cost his life. It cost him his life. So you have these examples of success, and then you have these example of sacrifice. And Luke doesn't want us to forget that. He doesn't want us to forget that the examples of success and the examples of sacrifice. Moving on, in verse 10, we see that, um, you know, if you see the heading there, it says, Jesus feeds the 5,000. It says, and on their return, the apostles told him all that had been done, and he took them and withdrew apart to to the town of Bethsaida. And when the crowds learned of it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away into the surrounding villages and the countryside to find lodging and to get provisions, for we are, uh, for we are here in a desolate, desolate place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. All right, and we know the fi- story of the five loaves and two fish. Okay? And so just skip down, uh, down to verse 17, and it says, And they all ate and were satisfied, and, was, and that which was left over was picked up, and twelve baskets of broken pieces were filled. Verse 18, And now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. Some say John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others that uh, that one of the prophets of old is risen, risen. And then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Christ of God. Wow. So let's you really get the scene here. I mean, Jesus just fed 5,000 people. The disciples just saw this happen. Other accounts, you know, go into a little bit more detail. But, but you know, Luke is kind of glossing through this, and he's kind of hitting the highlights. And, and um, you know, they just saw this happen, all this, you know, this miraculous thing happen. Man, God was providing in incredible ways. God, you know, Jesus was, was uh, healing sick people. He was preaching. On, I mean, he was on fire, you know. I, I believe Jesus could preach. I mean, if you get 5,000 people to sit there and listen to you without a microphone, you can preach, okay? All right? You know, Jesus was preaching up a storm, and people were getting healed. Demons were coming out. Uh, They just witnessed an incredible miracle. And then, you know, Jesus just has the, 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 probably the, the most ultimate recognition that he has ever had in his entire life in ministry. And Peter says to him, you're the Christ of God. You're the Son of God. Verse 21, And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day raised. So here we have it again. Extreme success. And Jesus saying, hey, guys, yes, all this is amazing, but listen, this is what's going to happen to me. An extreme sacrifice. All right? And the writer of Luke, you know, he kind of glosses through the feeding of the 5,000, but he pulls out what Jesus is saying about sacrifice. And then in verse 23, we see that, uh, you know, after Jesus predicts his death, sorry, in verse 18 to 20, and Jesus talks about the ultimate sacrifice. He had just received the ultimate accolade. You're the, you're the son of God. This is who you are. And, and, and he says, yes, but this is, this is my task, and this is my ultimate sacrifice. Jesus was recognized and, and he, he, you know, I don't think he, he didn't tell them, he didn't say, like, don't tell anybody because he had, like, this bout of, you know, false humility, <laughs> you know, because other accounts of, of this in the gospel here, he received it. He was like, yeah, you're right. 
God has, God has showed this to you, Peter. Yeah, you're right. But then he goes on to say, listen. And he models something for the disciples here. Jesus models sacrifice. He models the kingdom of God an incredible breakthrough, an incredible anointing, an incredible, you know, success. But he also models a fully surrendered life. A fully surrendered life to the Father. And he models the ability to lay down to, for the ultimate sacrifice. And he goes on. You know, Jesus is really communicating that the kingdom of God is not without sacrifice. All right? Um, and, you know, this is the proportion of breakthrough and the proportion of blessing, I believe, is also the proportion of sacrifice. The level of sacrifice needs to be in proportion to the standard of our blessing in life. Okay? So let's deal with this in verse 23. It says, And then he said to them, And then he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. It's interesting he says daily. I don't know if you're like me. Probably the easiest thing to procrastinate is sacrifice. <laughs> you know, like, you know, we'll take the blessing, but oh, we can sacrifice tomorrow. You know, like, I'm going to start, you know, tomorrow's the best day to start a fast. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm going to start fasting tomorrow. You know, that, you know, that, that, that self-sacrifice, that laying, that it's, it's <laughs> you know, Jesus says daily, take up your cross daily and follow me. And whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So really what he's doing is he's going on and he's explaining how to take up your cross. He says, listen, you know, there's things that you want to do in life that there's things, you know, the Bible says that there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to destruction. There's, there's you know, there's things that you naturally want to do. There's this self-preservation, but if you, if you give in to that self-preservation when it comes to the kingdom of God, you're going to lose it. You're going to lose it. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, the mentality of self-preservation is not the way that we will see the world reached. A mentality of self-preservation is not the way that we will see the world reached. In fact, the desire to preserve oneself causes us to lose the very thing we are trying to preserve. If you're not willing to lay down your reputation if we're not willing to lay down our reputation, if we're not willing to lay down our finances, our dignity, if we're not willing to lay down others' perceptions of us for Jesus' sake, we cannot say that we are following him. Jesus goes on, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost. In other words, listen, we can apply biblical principle without relationship and it will work. There will be gain. Businesses that, that, are, that are, are built and booming, they're built on biblical principle. There's, there's elements in the, in the foundations and, and how they function because it works. Biblical principle works, and, and but if we have biblical principles without relationship, what begins to happen is we can even come to a place where we lose ourselves. We can work ourselves to death. <laughs> Matthew talks about you know, losing your soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. You can sometimes you, you can push so hard that you lose your mind. You can push so hard that you lose your will. To go on, I just, I just don't have anything. Left. And you come to a key moment in life where, like, you need that push, 
in order to break through, and, and you just don't have it because you're so played out. <sighs> lose your will. You lose your emotions, and you, you lose control of your emotions. You wind up hurting people who are the closest to you in, in life. It's getting quiet in here. So the word of God works, and, and if we follow the principles, you know, we will start to have influence. And there, there is the possibility for great gain. I mean, Jesus says it right there. He says, listen, you can gain the whole world, but you can still lose yourself. You can still lose yourself. You can lose your emotions. You can start to fly out of control and hurt those around you. Being willing to lose for the sake of Jesus. Listen, not for the sake of loss. Not, not just for the sake of like, oh, I'm suffering. You know? Like, I'm so proud of my suffering. So proud of my self-humility. You know? <laughs> like, not... Not for, not for the sake of just doing it, but for the sake of just following Jesus. Listen, you know, like, it, it's kind of like, uh, you know, tithe and offering is, is part of giving up things that in the world's mind, it's like, man, that's opposite. You're, you're, you're giving away things, you're, you're giving away so that, you know, and, and you're expecting that you'll be taken care of and you'll be blessed in return. What? Okay? That's part of giving up some things. A Sabbath. A Sabbath rest is part of giving up some things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to intentionally set side a time, a time aside to rest. If you don't believe the Bible, believe Winnie the Pooh. He says that sometimes the very best of something starts from nothing. <laughs> okay? All right? Or doing, sorry, doing, I, I said it wrong. Doing nothing leads to the very best of something. There's times God has created us to have cycles of rest where we actually say, hey, I'm going to lose, I'm going to, you know, uh, I, um, in, we're not, we're not going to, we're going to not chase that rabbit. Um, <laughs> where we're willing to give something up, you know, we're willing to give something up that, that seems to be opposite of, of the very thing we're going for. Say, like, you know, well, I could work another, another 12 hours, but I'm, I'm going to intentionally just take some time to rest and to rejuvenate. A lot of times, it's in those moments that your best ideas come. Your best ideas come. Laying down our reputation on the altar. Listen, it may be increasingly unpopular to be a Jesus follower in our day. And I'm not one of those who's saying, oh, the U.S. needs persecution. I'm like, no, it doesn't stop. <laughs> You've never seen persecution. <laughs> what we need is we need life with Christ. We need life with Jesus. All right? We, you know, we, we don't want to become so proud of persecution, so proud of suffering. We, what we want is we want to say, Jesus, I'm fully surrendered. You have my yes. And you get to write in. Jesus, you get to write in what it's for. But you have my yes. That's what we need. That's what we need. So Jesus is reminding us that even though there is a possibility of gain, there's this divine tension that exists that the greater the gain you experience, there is a need for a greater willingness to sacrifice. Jesus takes it a step further. In verse 26, he says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words... Of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of that of the holy angels. See, Jesus knows that as we grow in influence in the eyes of the world, it can become more and more difficult to openly embrace and declare our allegiance to him. We can let that slip. 
I'm not saying that we got to be weird and y'all got to go get a, you know, I love Jesus bumper sticker or something. But I'm saying like, you know, in, in, our, in our life, you know, we can, we can just cushion it a little bit and like, well, we're just really cool people, you know? No, we, we follow Jesus. We follow a different set of guidelines in our life. We're trying to please someone other than just ourselves or our spouse or our friends or our community. We're living to a higher call and a higher standard. As we become more successful, I, I know this isn't true for anybody here. I'm talking about the church down the road. Okay. <laughs> As we become more successful, it can be easy to slip into becoming less sacrificial. So we get this one-two punch from Luke here. And then he says, okay, that's enough. Let's, let's take a breather. Let's go on to the transfiguration. <laughs> okay? And so we see that... Uh, you know, after Jesus says these really hard and challenging things, listen, I'm preaching to you just as much as, I, I, I'm preaching to me, <laughs> I'm, man, I'm preaching to me just as much as I'm preaching to you. You, you get this? Because this is, it's the word of God that's speaking. It's, it's, not, it's not just me this morning. And so as, as much as I am a speaker, I'm also a listener, Okay. And so it says in verse 28, it says, And now, about eight days after these things, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up to the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, man, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure. And when he was about to, what he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem, now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it, it's really good that we're here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing that what he was, what, uh, sorry, not knowing what he said. And as he was Saying these things, a cloud came over and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent and told no one in those days anything that they had seen. Wow. So Jesus is up on the mountain, and uh, just a few of the disciples were there with him. And they saw this encounter that happened to him. They, you have Moses representing the historical word of God. You have Elijah, who was like the first spiritual father and no, one, one of the major prophets who represents the Holy Spirit and what he was doing as well as spiritual parenting. And you have them counseling Jesus, saying, listen, this is what you're going to go through. This is what you're going to, to accomplish in Jerusalem. This is what's going to happen to you. And, and, and the disciples are just sitting there taking this all in like, Whoa! Talk about glory. I mean, we talk about glory. This was glory. I mean, the, the, the physical appearance of Jesus, even his clothing changed and began to shine and dazzle. I mean, that was glorious. Talk about the, like an apex of success. And I, when I, okay, an apex of experience. Maybe success isn't the right word, but an apex of experience with God. Like, whoa, did you see that? John, man, did you see what Jesus, what, what was happening there? That is crazy. What is God doing in our day? That's amazing. And they have this incredible experience. So we see that again, you know, this thing of like John the Baptist beheaded. Miracles happening by the, sign, by the hands of the apostles and those sent out. We see, we see all of these, you know, great and incredible experiences, great levels of sacrifice. They come down from there, and there's a demon-possessed boy who was brought by his father. And it says on the next day, verse 37, the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. And behold, a man from the crowd cried out, saying, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, and he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out, and it convulses him. 
and he foams at the mouth and shatters him, and it will hardly leave him. And I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. And Jesus answered and said, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. And while he was coming, the demon threw him on the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. So they have this incredible experience of coming down out of the mountain with Jesus and and. And you know, other account, other gospel accounts tell us that that Jesus, you know, there's really kind of he's teaching uh, the people he's about to send out. He's teaching them about, about prayer and fasting and deliverance because he says, you know, some don't come out except by prayer and fasting. But it's interesting that Luke doesn't even highlight that here. He just goes on. He says, listen, you know, this is what happened. And Jesus kind of rebuked his disciples, cast out the demon, healed the boy, gave him back to his father. And then it says that they were in awe of the majesty of God. They were in all of the majesty of God. And in that moment, in that time, Jesus takes time again in verse uh, 40, for, the end of verse 43 says, but while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, listen, he's modeling something here. He says, let these words sink into your ears. The son of man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand what he was saying, and it was concealed from them so that they might not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about this saying. Jesus is telling them, listen, guys, and I believe he's telling them for our sake because it was, it was concealed to them, but he's telling that, listen, you know, when things really start to work for, you know, and we see, man, you know, we're praying, we're fasting, we can think that it's because of us and because of you know, because of God's, you know, uh, what God's doing in us, we, we can start to maybe be like, maybe like the disciples were, like, hey, this is working, this is cool, man, you know, this is awesome, like, and, and, and Jesus continually brings us back to this place of like, listen, I'm going to lose my life. It's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost. There's a, a sacrifice. So Jesus wants to set the stage here he wants to set the stage that radical success requires radical sacrifice. Radical success requires radical sacrifice. In following Jesus. So then the disciples go on and, you know, they have this argument about who's the greatest and, <laughs> and uh, you know, Jesus comes in and he knows what they're reasoning in their hearts and took a child and put it in the middle of them and said, listen, guys, come on. Whoever receives this child in my name receives me and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you, he who is least among you all is the one who is great. In other words, guess what, guys? You know, it wasn't until, you know, I was going through this for this message that I read it this way. I was like, in other words, Jesus is saying, listen, you're all great. Even the least among you is just as great. Even the least among you is just as great. Yeah? Yeah? Now, we know that, that he's calling them to service and, listen, calling them to sacrifice, but he's saying, listen, you know, the, the greatness isn't the measure here. Greatness isn't the measure. Jesus, up until now, has been saying what is worth sacrificing for. And here... At this juncture, it begins to switch. And he says, now he begins to tell us what is not worth sacrificing for. In Luke 9, verses 49 to 50, it says, Jesus answered, or sorry, John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, don't stop him. For the one who is not against you is for you. You know, Jesus really, you know, what I take it there is, is Jesus saying, listen, you're going to see a lot of people doing a lot of things in my name. 
Don't worry about them. You do what you're supposed to do. You're going to see a lot of people doing a lot of things. Some of it's going to be crazy. Some of it's going to be like weird. Some of it's going to be like, I know that's wrong. You know, don't worry about it. Just do what you're supposed to do. Just do what you're supposed to do. It goes on, verse 51, And when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to, go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered the village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. Now, if we go back to other accounts, you know, we, we know that the Samaritans knew who he was. There was the woman at the well. But why didn't they receive him? Because his face was set towards Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? <laughs> Listen, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to try and get you on board with their, uh, you know, with their prejudice. The Samaritans, they didn't want anything to do with Jesus because there was prejudice between the Samaria and Jerusalem. There was prejudice between the Samaritans and the Jews. And they didn't like each other very much. And they had reasons, and they had all their reasons, and all this kind of stuff. And, and you know, I believe Jesus was modeling something. Listen, it's not worth giving up the kingdom in order to fit in with the prejudices of a group of people. Yeah? <laughs> And then in the same way, you know, uh, who's it, James and John, they're like, call out, do you want us to call on fire? And he's like, no. <laughs> okay? In other words, it's not worth giving up. It's not worth giving up the kingdom to join those who are judging those with prejudices. All right. People will want you to agree and validate their prejudices. Don't. Don't sacrifice your mission and your calling to please cultural expectations of people. Others will want you to validate and empower and condone their judgment of those with prejudice. Don't. People will want, you, people will want to pull you into their political agenda. And I'm not saying don't be involved in politics. What I'm saying is don't have a political spirit. Don't be dominated by a political spirit. So Jesus, verse 55, says, and he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. You know? So Jesus, <laughs> you know, these guys, they're like, man, Look, we, we saw what you can, we saw the power of God in action. And she said, listen, it's, it's not for you to judge these people. And in fact, you know, one thing I believe in, this is kind of what I think the whole context of these uh, several verses is this, that don't, uh, don't view people from the perspective of right and wrong, but view them in light of how they may be saved. So don't sit there and be like, oh, those Samaritans, they're so prejudiced. They're so horrible, you know. No, how, how will the Samaritans be saved? That needs to be our perspective. How will our neighbors be saved? Not, oh my goodness, I can't believe what our neighbors are doing. Yeah? I can't believe the signs they put out in their yard. I mean, just, <laughs> you know. How will they be saved? Not right or wrong. Listen, none, none of us can stand before God and say like, oh, we're right enough now. Yeah? Rather, our heart and our mission and our calling and our focus needs to be on how will these people be saved? How will these people know the gospel? They may reject it. That's okay. But how will they know? How will they know? <clears throat> Verse 57, we're finishing up chapter 9 here. And as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. 
And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds have, of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus is communicating to this individual a level of sacrifice, the level of sacrifice that it takes to follow him, saying, Are you ready to give up control of home? Are you ready to give up your right to control your environment? Because that's really kind of what our homes are, right? It's like our domain. <laughs> it's the right for us to control our environments. Are you willing to give that up? And Jesus kind of resets their expectations, saying, listen, yeah, there's glorious things that are going to happen in the kingdom of God. There's glorious things as we see the kingdom of God come. There, you know, people are going to get healed, set free, saved, delivered, and, and you're, you're going to get notoriety. People are going to find out what's happening. Things, you know, you're going to become known, but it's not for the sake of building yourself. It's for the sake of the kingdom of God. Even though there's greatness coming, there's also great sacrifice coming, and they're married together. And in the kingdom, you cannot separate the two. Don't sacrifice obedience to Jesus for the comforts of life. To another, he said, follow me. This is someone, you know, the first person was like, hey, I'll follow you. This one, Jesus says, you, come, follow me. He said, Lord, let me first go and bury, bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead, bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Don't sacrifice obedience and following Jesus. Now we understand that, that this gentleman's father, or, or as I say, it's a man, I forget. Um, this, this person's father, thanks. <laughs> she keeps me straight. It doesn't say that, that you know, the, the father had died. He was probably just old or sickly, you know, and so this this person was going to go home and just, you know, kind of nurse and take care. And, and, and Jesus said, listen, I've called you. I've called you. Don't sacrifice obedience and following Jesus even for family expectations. Expectations put on by others. It doesn't mean that you need to reject your family. Hear what I'm saying, okay? All right? But there's, there's a higher call than a cultural call. There's a higher call than like you know, expectations put on you by other people. It's expectations put on you by Christ when he calls you. And he says, I gave my life. Will you give yours? I did whatever I needed to do to fit into the mission that the Father had given me. Will you do the same? Yet another, verse 61 and 62, said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those in my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And really, what's Jesus dealing with? He's dealing with excuses. This person had excuses as to why he would not follow Jesus right now. Like, oh, let me go and take care of this. Let me go and take care of this. Oh, it, you know, this, you have to understand warm cultures and hospitable cultures. Like, if you go to the Middle East, like, like your guests are the apex of, the, of, of those who are important in your house, right? Okay, so this is the culture that we might not always get that in our, in our Western culture, but, like, you don't, you don't shame a guest. Like, you don't drop a guest you don't, like, drop hospitality, you know, in these cultures. And, and he's saying, oh, you know, I need to go and finish my hospitality with my guests. And, and, and Jesus is like, listen, don't sacrifice the kingdom and the call of God in your life to put up, to, to don't, don't sacrifice that in order to adhere to cultural relevance. He puts them through the test of priority. Are you willing to lay down your right to define your priorities and to take up the priorities of the kingdom? And how this affects us today and, and preaching to me is like, you know, am I, are we willing to pause and have that important conversation that centers around the gospel or the kingdom of God in the middle of our agenda-filled, busy day?
There may be things in, in our life that are culturally expected. And God's not against those things. But what he's saying is, is let me give you the priorities for your life. Are we willing to lay down our right for our priorities and say, God, you, I'm going to take your priorities. I, I want you to give me the priorities. This is the mentality that Jesus brought people into right before he sent them out to see incredible miracles happen in Luke chapter 10. And I believe that it's a part of our mentality that we need to have. And you know, one thing that I believe is that Jesus chose the cross way before the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, there's... There are certain questions that you don't have to deal with if you've already made a decision. You know? Like, I don't have to, I don't have to deal with questions about, like, is my wife, is Sheree the one? That decision's been made. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? All right? All right, that doesn't mean that you don't challenge, you know, go through challenges and hiccups and you know, all those kind of things and relationships. But you know, those decisions are, are made. And, 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 and I want to invite you this morning to come before God and to make just a fresh decision. Because God wants to bring us into those you know, experiences and successes and, and all those things for the kingdom of God. But it's not without the recognition of sacrifice to say, God, I'll, I'll lay it all down if I need to. And the last two points for Friends Sunday <laughs> is that, you know, in Luke 10, it talks about sons of peace. And the way you find sons of peace is you sow the gospel liberally. Uh, Larry was here talking to our small group leaders the other week. He talked about the four fields, you know, the, the stony ground, the thorny ground, the hard ground, and the good soil. Yeah? But how do you find it? Well, you don't know until you sow. And so we, we share the gospel liberally, but as we're doing that, because that's, that's what it means to preach or to proclaim the gospel, it means to stand in the middle of the town and herald it. Like, hey, just want to let you know there's a new king in town, and he has conquered and defeated all my enemies, so this is going to change the way you have to live your life. You are now free, you know? All right, that's the gospel. That's the essence of the gospel, is that the enemy has been vanquished, and everything that the enemy has to hold over our lives has been destroyed, and we can now live free. And we need to proclaim that openly. But then, as we do that, we need to do what Luke ten talks about and find sons of peace. And really, who those are is just those who God has prepared to receive the gospel. You know, as, as much as we want to pray for our, we, we, you know, we want to be praying for our coworkers that, like, are totally against hearing anything from us, and, you know, we can even make it our own private little internal goal to, like, get them saved <laughs> when they don't want to be saved yet, you know. It's our job to find those who God has prepared and just look for those open doors. So pray for coworkers, pray for those who are hard, but look for those who, have, who are open, who are hungry, who are thirsty for the gospel and for what you have to say. That's, that's what Jesus started out here in Luke 9. It says that he sent out the 12, and he said, listen, if, you know, go, to where, go to where you're going, share the gospel, and if they receive you, stay there. If they don't receive you, move on. All right, so we got to get over that fear of rejection. Okay, got to get over that fear of rejection. You'll, you know, there, anyway, all right. So let's take some time. Can we stand together? Someone want to come play keyboard? I don't know. So my invitation to you this morning is to refresh or make a fresh commitment to the Lord about the level of sacrifice you're willing to give to God. This can be, you know, 
in light of evangelism, and, or it can also be in light of, God, I'm, you know, I've had some experiences and I've had some, seen some things that you've done, but I'm going to commit again to learning what I need to learn. You know, sometimes as, as we get older, it's like, well, the world changes around us and we kind of need to commit to changing to keep up with it. All right. God, are you going to walk with, am I going to walk with you in that? So, Father, we come before you this morning. Lord, we, we recognize that you don't sugarcoat stuff in your word. And so we don't want to sugarcoat it either. You know, if you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus, it's the best thing you ever do. But it's the most expensive thing you ever do. It takes everything. Jesus doesn't want half your heart. He doesn't want half your life. He wants it all. He wants it all. The gospel is this, that God in the beginning, he created mankind. He created the world. He created us to have relationship with him. And in the beginning, mankind was connected to him, the one who knew who we are, why we exist, what we're called to do. And there was enjoyment in that relationship. And then Satan led a rebellion against God and man, mankind. We followed Satan's rebellion against God. We believed Satan more than we believed. We believed the lies of Satan more than we believed the truth of God. And because of that, sin came into the world and sin came into our life. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And that, that, there's, that sin separates us from God. It separates us from relationship. And, and so mankind was separated from the one who knew them, the one who understood them, who created them. But God didn't want it that way. He wanted his children back. And so he made promises throughout time, and that's what the Old Testament talks about. There's many different prophetic voices of, of God going to send a redeemer. He's going to send someone to, to buy us back. He's going to send us to, he's going to send someone to us to bring us back into relationship with him. And he sent Jesus Christ, his son, to die on the cross, to take the punishment for you and for me, for your sin and for my sin, to remove the thing that separates us from our heavenly father. Jesus did that, but we have to make him Lord. We have to come and lay down our life and say, God, I, I'm going to lay down my life and I'm going to receive yours. It's, it's a great exchange. It's not like 50-50. I'll give you 50% of my life to get 50% of yours. It's, it's a great exchange. 100% to 100%. God, I, I lay down my life and I ask you to be the Lord, the King of my life. That's really what that word Lord means. It means the King, the Supreme Ruler. And he did that. And if today, if you've never given your life to Jesus, it would be my utmost honor to pray with you to do that if you're here and you've given your life to Jesus already but you're impacted by this message this morning you know to give God your yes that's really what supreme lordship is all about is saying God I don't get to defer I don't get to define the terms of my commitment I just get to define my decision It's on your terms, God. It's on your terms. It's on your terms. You're the Lord. You're the King. You're God. Thank you, Jesus. for 
a great outpouring of the Lord, it's important that we go deep, that we go deep with God. You know, we know the, the story of the, te- of the widow with two mites where she comes and she gives her two cents in the offering and Jesus who's standing there says, and she's given it, given more than anybody else because they gave out of their surplus and she gave out of her need. And that really defines how God sees our contribution to his kingdom. Is, is, it's not about what it is. It's not about, you know, it, if we have a great voice or not. Or, and it's not about what it is. It's about the level of sacrifice that it takes for you to give it. And that's what's beautiful to the Lord. That's what's beautiful to the Lord. That's what he sees as lovely. So for some of you, it might, it might just be like the ability to like in front of other people, shaking and trembling in fear, say, God, I'm going to go and kneel at the altar, you know, like, because that's, that's a sacrifice that I can't define for you. Nobody can define that for you, but you know what it is in your own heart. And maybe for someone like me who, who's, who's kind of just blah, <laughs> You know, that's not a big sacrifice to come and stand at the altar. You, you see, it's, it's not about comparing ourselves with each other. It's about, it's about coming before God and saying, God, I, I, I give it all. I, I sacrifice. And, and God's, the beautiful thing is that God sees in secret and he rewards openly. He rewards openly. So it's not about comparison. It's not about what others see you doing. It's about what God sees in your heart, what God sees you doing in your life. And it's a high standard. There's only one standard for your life, and it's the standard that God has for you. It's not my standard. It's not Cleon's standard. It's not Alan's standard. It's the standard that God has for you. I'm trying to end. It just keeps pressing. (laughs) I think it's good for us to sit in times like this, though. Jesus. Maybe for some of you, you need to lay down the right to be afraid. Because you've used it as as an excuse all of your life that has held you back. It's like, oh, I'm afraid. We come and we stand and we sing, I'm fearless in your presence. Let it be true. Let it be true. Father, let us be more governed by love than by fear. We recognize, God, we, we're human. We have fear, Lord. But let us be governed by love. Let us be obedient to love instead of being obedient to fear. And Father, if we have lived a life of sacrifice and we come to a place where it's comfortable and easy and you want us to refresh our willingness to sow, to sacrifice, We come, we come, we come.